Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Just want to stick a pen there. And just um, for any chauvinist that may be watching that have a problem with this, that women are created in the image and likeness of God. So when you see women, you see the image and the likeness of God. It's not just limited to a male figure. Women are created in the image and likeness of God. And anything that's created in the image and the likeness of God can be used by God equally. Okay, just make sure we get that. All right, let's go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 7. It says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Last one I want you to read right now. Let's go to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. And we'll read the first four verses. Psalm 63, starting with verse 1, says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary." Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. So we're going to talk about this for a topic, made for worship. I was made for worship. You may have your seats. In this room, Right now, and those who are watching this, this message, are all different types of bodies, all different types of shapes. Some are thin. Some are thin once. There was a time. There's thinness in there. S some of us um, have larger skulls than others. Um, I have a strong neck because it has to support a huge skull here. Don't say amen. Look, you know what? <laughs> Either way, y'all were going to say amen, and, and that's just really awful. I was going to buy y'all lunch today, but since y'all did that, we were all created with different shapes we were born in different years. Some of us um, have different things going on in our bodies right now. Some of you are, have a clean bill of health and nothing's wrong. Uh, some of you are like me. The other day I sneezed and one of my knees popped. Um, Braylon, don't laugh at that. Um, we are all different types of shapes, different types of conditions, and we all have the same responsibility to use what God has given us to worship him. And when God gave me this, he reminded me that my voice is the only thing that worships him. We were actually created to worship the Lord. I'm going to just take a poll here. Indulge me, if you will. Those of you in this room watching this um, online, you can respond to. Before we got into our time of worship this morning, did anybody have any kind of mental or physical or emotional distraction going on? Anybody? Okay. All right. After we had a time of expression of worship, do you feel the same way? 
your body is specifically res- um, specifically designed to respond to the worship of the Lord. It is healthy for us to worship God. It is healthy and vital to our health and our existence in the earth that we worship the Lord. We are created in his image and in his likeness, and we are the only creation with that distinction. When we read this in Genesis 1, when God was forming the heavens and the earth and land as we know it, he was speaking and it was. When he said, let there be light, light came because he spoke it. When he said, let there be seas and let there be firmament and let there, let there be stars and sun, even let there be animals, he spoke that and they were. But when it came to you and I, he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. We weren't just spoken, we were formed. And we were formed to look like him, to carry his will in the earth. And then he did something in Genesis 2, it records, not only did he form us, but he used his own breath to breathe into us. So we are the special ones that carry the breath of God. We carry the very breath of God in our being. And every time we reproduce, we channel that breath to what we reproduce. So our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children carry the breath of God in their body. So when David had the admonition in Psalms 150, he said, let everything that hath breath, He wasn't talking to lions and tigers and bears. He was talking to us. He was talking to us because we have the ability to return back to God what he gave to us. And when you return back to God what he's given us, that is worship unto God. We were created to do it. Our bodies are shaped to do it. And when we do it, we feel better. Because you always feel better when you operate in purpose. All right. We're a new identity church. My, my heart and my goal and the whole premise of this church is for the creation to connect with this creator so we can find his purpose. And I will tell you, all of us have the same purpose to worship God. Our functions may be different. Our assignments may be different. Our responsibilities in the earth and our lifetime may be different, but we all have the same purpose because everything that we do is worship unto God. It's not just the lifting of our hands. It's not just the bowing of our heads. It's not just the tears that we cry and all of that is acceptable. But it is who we are away from the moments that we have here. All that we do is worship to the Lord. I look at worship in this working definition. It's not not an absolute, but this is what I pull up. Let's pull up this definition of worship. I say worship is a means of willful devotion, passion, sacrifice, and servitude that reflects one's worth. I'm going to read this again. Worship is a means of willful devotion, passion, sacrifice, and servitude that reflects one's worth. Notice I didn't say anything about God in this working definition. Because even though we were all created to worship, we may not all recognize that we were created to worship God. But we're all created to worship, so we'll wind up worshiping something. We'll all wind up worshiping something if we don't recognize God's worth in our life. A means of willful devotion, which means it's not forced to do it. My my main conundrum as a worship leader, I've been a worship leader for like 30 years now. I know what you're saying. You can't be that old. Yeah, I know. So once again, somebody laughed way too loud. You're costing meals. Listen, in all of my life that I've been doing this, I was taught how to move crowds. Hear me. I was taught how to move crowds and get responses. And I have a problem with it now because a lot of that would be of my own doing. And if it's out of my own doing, is it authentic? If I tell you to do it, Is it authentic worship? 
If I say lift your hands, you lift your hands because I said it, not because you felt it. And so I have a quandary as a worship leader how to lead people into something without it being Simon Says. Because if it's Simon Says, then you're only responding to Simon and not God. So I have to be very careful in my language that it is not directive, but that it invites you to do what you may be feeling in the moment. And my job is to let you know as a worship leader, it's okay to do that now. That as I do it myself. So as a worship leader, the responsibility of the worship leader is to worship and not to lead. It's to actually do it myself that it invites you to do it as well. But if it's a matter of instruction, then, it, then the worship becomes to the instructor and not the Lord. And there's not a person in the earth that can handle what's supposed to be for God. When we worship anything other than God, our bodies and our minds and our souls cannot line up with it freely. When we worship our spouses, when we worship our children, when we worship our jobs, when we worship our money, when we worship ourselves, when we worship fear, when we worship misery, when we worship pain, when we worship pessimism, when we worship laziness, we're giving attributes to something that cannot fulfill, that only God can fulfill. When we give willful devotion to anything other than God, it becomes out of order. If you worship me as a pastor, I know y'all ain't doing that, but if you worship me as a pastor, I can't handle it. So, because I wasn't meant to handle it. And now I've become an egomaniac because I can't handle what's supposed to be for God. It takes people out of their system when you worship them and not him. So ideally, we are supposed to be ones who show forth the praises of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light that we don't take any of the glory ourselves, but we commit ourselves, even if someone compliments us because of what we're doing, we teach them that it had not been for God, we couldn't do what we did. So when we say glory to God, we reflect that worship. Don't worship me, worship the one who gave me the ability to be a blessing. Amen? So anything that you love, you can love. But there's a thin line between love and worship. If your love is obsessive to a thing, you're leaning to a place of worship of something that should not be worshipped. There are some people who love their cars more than God. There are people who love their acumen and the things that they get more than God. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is you were built to worship just not the stuff that he created. Because anything that has been created can perish. Anything that's been created, nothing's going to last forever. So the only one who can handle worship is the one who's everlasting. We give the everlasting one the worship that he deserves. I want to give you this. Worship shows God's worth to you. And as you worship God, he shows his worth through you. Say that again. Worship shows God's worth to you. And as you worship God, he shows his worth through you. So it's like this. It's not just me lifting the hands in the sanctuary, even though it is. It's not just me singing aloud in church, even though it is. It's not just me running and dancing and shouting and crying, even though it is. But it's also the way I live away from the service because, and here's an adage that I live by, it's a core value that I live by, and it's the truth. You can't see everybody, but everybody can see you. And you never know when they're watching. You never know when someone is taking notes of your life. And everyone is looking to be inspired whether they mean it or not. Whenever we interact with one another, we are walking inspirations. And people can see how you behave, and how you behave is worship to God. Can I help you? All right, there's a story in the Bible of, uh, of the Queen of Sheba. She's a queen. She's already rich, all right? But she was not a believer, and she came to test Solomon. The Bible says he, she asked him hard questions, tough stuff, and he answered every question. And then he took her to his house. Now, she already has a castle. She already has a kingdom. But she took him to his house. And the Bible records this, that when she saw everything laid out in his house, the way everything was designed, and saw the servants 
and the cupbearers and the handmaidens. And the scripture says, and the way they all ascended to the Lord. When she saw how everything in his house worshiped God, it took her breath away. And she was able to commit herself to her God based on what she saw out of Solomon's house. Her worship was based on what she saw in his house. Not just his cry out, not just his hands being lifted, his house worshiped God. So he didn't do something in the temple and his house looked different than what the temple, than what he did in the temple. How I worship God here is how I live there. So when you come to my house, everything in my house lines up to give glory to God. The way I take care of things, the way I handle my affairs, the way I handle my matters, the way I raise my children, the way I live alone, all of it is worship to God. And someone's always watching. So my question is, how can you reflect God's worth in your life? And this is not being overboard. This is not being a holy roller. This is not being obnoxious because we know people like that. When you, when you talk to them, all they, all they do is just, just speak spiritually. And that could get, get a little annoying. It's like, okay, don't want to talk to you right now. Be a human being, please. So you can be a human being and still honor God with your life. Amen. You can still enjoy things in the earth and still honor God with your life. But God's worth to you should be reflected in your life. And if I'm around you and I can't tell if God is in your life, then that means you're worshiping something else. Israel Holden said it like this. We'll get in the habit of being a church person and we'll worship the worship. Instead of worshiping God, we'll come into service and learn how to do all the Christian stuff for an hour and a half, and our life doesn't reflect God away from it. So we'll worship the sound. We'll, we'll worship the, 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 the music. We'll worship certain songs. Like we won't even respond unless a certain song is done. So we're worshiping the song itself. And we'll withhold ourselves because the worship is about the environment and what we do in it and not the God of the environment. So the challenge is that if we're doing what we're made to do, that means it is our life. And our life should reflect the worship of our God. Are we okay? So I want to give you this. I want to give you how worship is revealed. How worship is revealed. There, there, there are, are chronological steps. I don't want us to get, I don't want us to get um, caught up in, in com- comparison. I hope I'm saying this way, the right way. I don't want you to come into our doors and you'll look to your left and you'll look to your right and you see people who express themselves a certain way and get intimidated because you don't express in the same way that they express. Is, is that making sense? That, that all of a sudden I feel weird because they're louder than me or they're speaking in tongues and I can't right now or they're open or they're moving around and I don't do that. God honors obedience. God honors obedience. So if you are doing something because someone else did it, and not because he called for it, there's no honor in it. Honor is in obedience. If you're not a crier, don't sit up there and thump yourself in the eye so you can cry. If that ain't your deal, okay. If you're not a runner, okay, it's all right. You're not out of the will of God if you don't worship the same way someone else does. Worship starts with authenticity. Are we good? Worship starts with authenticity. Now, when we come into environments like this, we learn how to express ourselves unto the Lord even further. But it is not, there's a difference between learning and adopting what we learn than becoming something else. Okay? Because what you learn still has to be authentic. Amen. I was put in a situation recently that um, um, someone wanted to have a coffee meeting. And I'm not a coffee drinker. Okay? Okay? And so I said, okay, listen, if this is what you do, then, you know, we, we do what people do if they're, you know, you know. So I'll sit here and I'll have some coffee with you, all right, because they just love coffee, all right. Now I'll drink this coffee. And the coffee doesn't do a thing for me. It, it, it just doesn't, right? I, I, you know, and they're putting all this kind of stuff in the coffee and telling me all the wonderful things about coffee. And, and, and you got creams and you got caramels and, and this. Now, now it's a milkshake at this point. It's a, it's a. It changed colors twice. Like it was, it was dark. Now it's light skin. Now it's a little, a little beige. 
is we got all kinds of things going on. Is this coughing anymore? Where, where did the coffee go? So in the moment, I drank the coffee, but it didn't become a life pattern because it was an authentic connection for me. Are you hear what I'm saying? In the moment, I could do it with the person who's off, who authentically drinks coffee and has all these mixes, but it ain't my deal. Now, I'm not speaking against it, but it wasn't my deal. What we'll do is we'll come into church and we'll see people respond a certain way and we'll speak against it because it ain't our deal. That's them. And it's okay. What I would want you to do is to be open to what God wants. If you give me something that I ain't asked for, I may give it back. But if you give me something that I asked for, I may bless you back. It's about obedience. Be obedient to what God is asking for. So if you're in a moment of worship and God is saying, bow before me, there's a reason why. If you're in a place of worship and he's saying, lift your hands in my name, there's a reason why. I was just in a service in Alabama a couple of weeks ago, and this woman told me that before, the, before she came in, she could not rotate her arm. And the Lord told her to lift her hands in the service. And now she could rotate her arm. She'd been going to the hospital and getting shots and everything else and couldn't move her arm. And she just did like this in my face. And I didn't know what she was doing. She said, because of the worship of the Lord today, I can move my arms. I'm telling you, worship is healthy for you. But it's tied to obedience. So when we come into the house of the Lord, what you should bring is, what you should bring is your praise based on how you know him. Because when you praise God like you know him, we can see him as he is. And the scripture says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. It doesn't mean that we're going to all say the same thing. When we say different things about him, we can see him as he is. Give me a couple of minutes here. The word magnify, when you use a magnifying glass, anybody ever use a magnifying glass? A magnifying glass does not make an object bigger. A magnifying glass allows you to see it more clearly. It's the same size, but when you use a magnifying glass, you're not able to see everything that there is to it. When we magnify God, we don't make him bigger. We, we see him more clearly as we magnify him. So it takes you to praise him like you know him, for you to praise him like you know him, for you to praise him like you know him, and when it all gets mixed together, we all get to see how great he is. There was four claps. I'm going to go further with this. Who knows God to be a healer? Just one person. Okay, let's just speak. Okay, so, so, all right. So, what you're going to do is as an example. So, you know God. You know God to be a healer. You know God that has done what no other power can do. You know what it's like to be afflicted and stricken in your body. And the Lord himself healed you. So, when you stand in the service and we sing this song, Gratitude, like we just did, a hallelujah, and you thank him for being your healer, you put a healer in the atmosphere. Okay, so you're right there. Who knows God to be a deliverer? Who just pick and give me just one. Okay, so you. So you know what it's like to be in a, in, in a mess, in a situation that you cannot get yourself out of. All right, that not your intellect, not your money, not your sister, no one else. No one else can do this but God, and you know that. So when you sing hallelujah, and you put deliver in the atmosphere, we got deliver over here and healer right here. Who knows God to be a savior? Or just one person. Okay, okay, so you know God when nothing else could help. When you know when you you would be in hell right now, deep in sin, you were just a mess, but God saved you and you know it. So when you worship God back there, we got healer, we got deliverer, and we got savior going on at the same time. Who knows God to be a present help? Who, who just, just gets one? Okay, so we got right here. You know him to be a right now God, a God that answers prayer. So we got present help. We got savior. We got healer. We got deliverer working at the same time. So when we all praise him like we know him, then we can all see him because we all need him. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because when you worship him as a healer and you put that in the atmosphere, someone over here may need a healing. And now I know the healer is here because you praised him. Someone may need salvation because you praise him back there. Salvation is here. Someone may need deliverance but because you came in with your praise. We feel deliverance and we can all see how great we magnify him so we can see how great he is. There's our responsibility. And when we do it all together, it creates the type of glory that we need 
to go further in our life. Because you can't go further in your life without worshiping God. You can only go so far. Listen, cars, you can fill up your tank, all right? In Houston, filling up your tank is just a great, great idea. You're going to do it again, right? You can't drive too much. I don't care how nice your car is. If you don't have gas in your car, it's not going anywhere. If you are here in the earth, I don't care how wonderful, how beautiful you look. If you don't fill your space with worship, it's hard for you to function in the earth. You're built for it. Let me share this with you. We'll worship reveal. There are five things in how we reveal worship. Number one is focus. Number one is focus. You got to focus. Y'all know what it's like to be in a service and you, you, you're trying to lock in. You, everything's been happening in the car. Everything's been happening in your life. And you're trying to lock in. And then you'll be singing. Your presence is an open door. Did I lock the door? Oh, my God. My door ain't locked. Let me meet you. I, oh. You can get easily distracted. You'll start thinking about stuff that don't matter. Things that can't be fixed in the moment. Things that, that won't be resolved in the moment. You'll be focused on the argument that you had in the car on the way to church. You'll be focusing on, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> you, <laughs> all kind of things. We talked about this, and we, we use, we use um, Peter as an example. You can walk on water if you focus. And you can also sink if you're not. Worship requires focus. You need to lock in on why you are in the presence of God. It starts with focus. It starts with de de denying every piece of distraction, anything that tries to set your mind away, anything that tries to set your, mo your soul away. The Colossians 3 and 2 says this, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You cannot worship God when you're focusing on earthly things. So you got to get your, before you say hallelujah, before you say thank you, Lord, you've got to set your focus first. All right? So the next part, after focus, there's acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is key. Acknowledgement is key. It is a specific piece here. We read a scripture earlier that said, oh God, thou art my God. He's not just a God. He's not just the God. He is my God. Someone say, he's my God. I want you to say that with confidence. He's my God. See this ring on my finger? This ring on my finger signifies that Nicole Chantel Dixon White is my wife. You understand me? Huh? Did y'all did, did feel that change that just happened right there? No? Huh? That's my wife. Huh? Say something. That's, that's, that's my wife. She was married before, but not no more to that dude. She's my wife. See? There's a significance there. It's a definitive article. She's mine. So I can respond to her in a way that none of y'all can. Because she's my wife. I want you to know that God is not just a God. See, you have special access that only you have. I can't access him for you. You have that access. You have that relationship. He's my God. He'll respond to me because he's my God. He'll answer me because he's my God. He'll come through for me because he's my God. And I will praise him. So it's acknowledgement, okay? After acknowledgement, there is inventory. There is inventory. After focus and after acknowledgement, there is inventory. Inventory says, I am going to look at, study, research every single thing that he is and what he's done for me. We have a storage room back here, and every time I go into the storage room, I find something different in the room. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that was there. <laughs> I'll be looking for one thing and find, oh my, I didn't know we had 
a can of nacho cheese back there? That's crazy. You, there's so many things that are back there in that room, and I don't know who put them in there, but they are in there, and they're reserved for us to use. Got, got a car in December, and I know how to drive a car. I didn't read the manual. I just drove the car off the lot and went straight to Alabama in that car. But there are so many other features in the car that I continually discover. Oh, I can do that. And when you do inventory, you discover things that are there that you cannot see in the surface. When you worship God in inventory, inventory allows you to see all that there is to God as you worship. Psalms 103 and 2 says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then the rest of Psalms 103 lists all the benefits. If you ever get lost, if you ever get, if you feel like you don't have enough, read Psalm 103. Paste, paste it, lock it in, because it shows you all the wonderful benefits. You don't have just a God that just loves you and keeping you alive. No, you got benefits. You've got benefits. And here's the thing about benefits. You don't work for those. Okay? You work for a paycheck. You don't work for benefits. Benefits come along because they decide to give it to you. Okay? You, you, you're getting what God decided to give you, and you have benefits. And when you worship the Lord, you see the great inventory that comes along with it. So we got, we got focus. We got acknowledgement. We got inventory. And then there is testimony. Testimony. Because the worship of our God isn't just supposed to be internal. It's supposed to be external. Psalm, one, Psalm 34 and 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually. It's not just in my mind. It's not just in my heart. Because anything that you love a lot, you speak about it. Anything that you're passionate about, you speak about it. You want, you want proof? Anything that you're feeling, it'll come up in your conversation, even if the conversation isn't based on it. It's on your mind. It could be a good or a bad thing. All right? It's going to come out in your conversation. And what I'm saying is our conversations should be filled with the worship of our God. We, we, we converse about our pain a lot. We converse about the things that we're going through a lot. We converse about our issues a lot. What I'm saying is converse about your God a lot. Converse about the one who can change anything at any time. And as you talk about him, he's obligated to change things for you. So we've got focus. We've got acknowledgement. We've got inventory and testimony. And here's the last one, hollowing. 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 Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. To hollow something is to consecrate it. To watch this, to present it as holy. To hollow is to present it as holy. It is not just to speak well about it, to present it as holy. It is difficult for broken people to speak about the holiness of God. But after you've taken proper inventory and you've given testimony as to who God is and you've acknowledged him and you focused in on all that he is, you can't help but to see him as he is. It is an overwhelming um, atmosphere that happens when you hollow the Lord. I may not be full, but you are full. I may not be complete, but you are complete. And I'm complete in you. I see you as you are. And I render you to be holy. And if you've ever been in the presence of a holy God, you can't take any kind of posture. When you're in the presence of a holy God, something has to happen to your body to reflect the holiness that you are in front of. The atmosphere is different. You ever, ever opened up a door or been around a door that's um, uh, ever been on a plane and the door open? You ever been through that in your life? Okay. So now the pressure of, of the situation is different because you're in a different atmosphere. All right. You, you're not supposed to be around an open door while, while it's open. If it's ever happened to your life, it's happened to me once. And what happened was, was when that door was open, it took every single person possible to try to pull that thing back together because the atmosphere that we were in was more powerful than us. And I said, my God, we're safe, though. We were safe and we landed safely, but we were in an atmosphere that we could not normally operate in. When the plane is on the ground, I can open and shut this door. But when it was elevated, it took nine or ten people that to use all of their strength because the magnitude of where we were is stronger than what we could handle. And so we worship the Lord in that way. His magnitude is greater than us. His magnitude, his power is greater than us. We're in a higher atmosphere. We acknowledge who he is, but then when we hollow him, we see him as he is, and we have no other choice but to bow our heads. We have no other choice but to lift our hands. We have no other choice but to cry because the atmosphere is too strong. We have no other choice but to bow before him 
Because the atmosphere is too strong. So worship reveal, focus, acknowledgement, inventory, testimony, hollowing. Focus, acknowledgement, inventory, testimony, hollowing. Focus, acknowledgement, inventory, testimony, hollowing. F A I T H. It takes faith to worship God. It takes faith to worship God. Not your logic, not your reasoning, not what you can figure out or what makes sense to you now. It takes faith to worship God, and the just shall live by faith. You can't live without worshiping God. You can exist in the earth, but you can't live without worshiping God. I want us to be committed not for, for, for personal reasons, not because I wanted to see y'all respond a certain way or do this or do that so we can have a certain type of service, but I want you on Wednesday afternoons, on Thursday mornings, on, on, on bus rides, on plane trips, on frustrated places, that you focus in to acknowledge who God is, that you take inventory of all that God has done, that you testify with your words and with your life and you hallow the name of the Lord. You can worship him anywhere. And wherever you worship him, he is known. I believe that, that, that sometimes we worship the Lord in unfamiliar places. It'll keep us safe in those places. That our worship to the Lord keeps us safe in unruly environments. That it'll prevent premature death because we worship him. That it'll keep people safe around us because we worship him. He looks for people to respond to. According to John 4, he looks for worshipers. He's an all-seeing God, but he's looking for people to worship him. He's looking for a place to respond. And if you worship the Lord correctly, you reveal worship correctly, I promise you he will always respond to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Woo! Got a little dark out here. I mean, the rain is coming. And the time I see rain, I get excited. I get excited. You know why? Because rain, according to the, to the cycle, rain is a receipt on a deposit. Okay. Rain, you like that one? Rain is a receipt on a deposit. Y'all know the water cycle to go to school. One of us being, a couple of us being, uh, yeah, yeah. It's cool. You remember this water cycle? You know anything about the water cycle? Forgot it. Okay, so th this applies to worship too. We're going to close on this. Worship cycle, there is condensation, evaporation, precipitation. Huh? Okay. Condensation is when, watch this, when water as a vapor is stored in the ground. When it's stored in the ground. We read scripture earlier that he formed us from the dust of the ground. But the scripture before that said there was a mist that covered the earth. The mist that covered the earth created condensation and he formed us from the dust of the ground and blew his breath into us. We are living creations of condensation made to worship the Lord. Now, whatever is placed in condensation can't stay there. It has to be released in evaporation. So what is in the ground gets released up in the mist. You don't ever see evaporation. You may see a fog, but you don't see the process of evaporation. Now, what happens in evaporation, it goes from the ground to the cloud and is stored in a cloud. But the cloud doesn't hold it but for so long. So, so evaporation is our prayer. Evaporation is our words of praise. Evaporation is our requests being made known unto him. But, but they don't stay there. And it doesn't come down the same way it went up. It went up in evaporation. But it comes down in precipitation. 
It went up in a mist, but it came down like rain. It, 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 went, it went up. You couldn't see it. It, didn't ha- it seemed like it didn't have any effect on it. But when it comes down, it hits everything. And whenever you send up, whenever you send up what God deserves, whenever you send up glory like God deserves, he goes from glory to glory. So whatever you send up, it comes down in a greater measure. Whenever you worship God, whenever you worship God with all that you have, it may seem like, Lord, this is weak, but this is all that I have is a hallelujah. It comes down like rain and it covers everything. It drenches everything. I don't care what your sprinklers do in your yard. They can't do what rain does. All right. Rain has a way of healing the land. And he made a promise if we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, not only would he heal from heaven and forgive our sins, but he'll heal our land. I'm telling you, if you worship God like you need to, he'll heal our land. He'll heal whatever's troubling you, and he will bless you accordingly in Jesus' name. Yes, God. Hallelujah. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. Do it the way you need to, but don't stop. However you know God, worship him according to how you know him, but don't stop. Don't stop. There's a power in your worship. The evaporation may seem like it's taking a long time, but God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. He receives your worship, and at, according to the right time, he'll pour down what you need like rain. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Get me out of here. All right. Mute my mic. <laughs>